welcome to chapel. The Lord be with you. One of the things that we do on a regular basis is as we begin chapel, we often have announcements. And sometimes announcements uh, come and they seem like an interruption to chapel, like they don't necessarily fit. Uh, it's things about athletics, uh, other extra extracurricular things, plays, concerts, uh, just the life of the school. And sometimes it doesn't seem like it, they fit very well. Uh, but I wonder if we think about them in a little bit different direction. And we think that when we come together, there's some 900 plus people with gifts, skills, talents, interests. And it's through announcements that we get to hear what some of you guys are up to. And we get to kind of join with you in uh, celebrating these things. And so we act more as a body then. And so perhaps through that, we can see it less as an interruption and more as a celebration of the things that you guys are involved in. So today's announcement is very short. Uh, it's simply about your student IDs, and it's that, I don't know, uh, student IDs get you in free to athletic events worth celebrating. Uh, don't forget your student ID, and if you don't have it, talk to the athletic office. Uh, so that's the only announcement. If you do have an announcement that you want to share with the entire student body, uh, talk to me, talk to Mr. Borst, uh, and this is true for students and for teachers. Uh, try to get that to us the Friday before chapel. Uh, try to talk to us before then, uh, and then we'll kind of take a look at what's going on in chapel and see, see, see if it fits. Uh, so that's announcements. Uh, another thing that we often do in chapel is something we call prayers to the world. Um, and if you've been around, you, you know kind of how this goes. Um, I remember having a conversation, I think it was last year, with a student about prayers to the world. And the student was complaining about this particular part of chapel. And we had a conversation, and eventually the student kind of fully kind of revealed why he didn't like prayers of the world. He says, Mr. Vanorf, I know I shouldn't say this, but I'm going to say it anyway. I just don't care. Like, what? Uh, my immediate reaction was I wanted to hit him upside the head. How could you say that? How could you not care that millions of people are being displaced from Syria? How could you care, not care about the civil unrest uh, here in the United States? Are you serious? You don't care? My immediate reaction was anger, but then as I kind of reflected on what he had said, actually I thought he was really courageous because what he said is actually true for me, and my guess is it's true for many of us, that a lot of times I don't care. And I really don't want to care. Not caring is actually pretty easy. And so as I've been thinking about that, I thought, you know what, that's not a reason to get rid of prayers to the world. We don't do prayers to the world because I care. We do prayers to the world so that we begin to care. Um, so as we do this, uh, perhaps it's, a, it's one of these things that trains us to think about the world, to see the world in a different way. When I was a kid, my parents taught me to pray uh, a certain way. They, they taught me to fold my hands, close my eyes, bow my head. Um, and I think now that I have kids, I know why they, they taught us that, because my kids like to stab each other with, with forks during prayer. Um, and so it's simply to, to have them do something with their hands. Um, but I think that posture is kind of like training wheels for riding a bike. Uh, it's necessary for a while, but there may be something that we should grow out of. Maybe this posture isn't the best posture for prayer. Folded hands, closed hands, closed eyes. Perhaps a better posture is open hands and open eyes. We open our hands to receive the gifts that God gives us and we receive them with gratitude. We open our hands and we bless the world in which we live. Or we lift up the world's cares and concerns to God. So we pray with open hands. And rather than closing our eyes to the issues of the world, we open our eyes to see the world in all of its beauty, and we give praise to God. And we open our eyes and we see all the brokenness in the world, and we cry out to God on its behalf. So this, this, the chapel committee, or the chapel class this year, already came up with this idea that perhaps we should focus on two things in prayers to the world. The beauty in the world, and give praise for that, and the brokenness in the world, and pray for healing. So we're going to watch a video in a second uh, as a way to open our eyes to some of the things that's been going on in the world in the last few months. Uh, and you'll notice that it's easier to pray for the brokenness because the brokenness, that makes the headlines. 
Take a look. So I think it's time to end the very artful smear that you and your campaign oh. have been carrying out in recent weeks. And let's talk, let's talk about the issues. Let's talk let's about talk the about issues that divide us. Where I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any voters, okay? It's like incredible. Arts. We stand with the people of Orlando who have endured a terrible attack on their city. Although it's still early in the investigation, we know enough to say that this was an act of terror and an act of hate. Don't shoot! Don't shoot! In Baton Rouge, where Alton Sterling was killed by police last week, 48 arrests overnight, following more than 100 arrests Saturday. Of Aisha Evans, a nurse from Pennsylvania being arrested for blocking a road, is being widely distributed on social media. According to police officers in Dallas, Texas, according to the police chief there, we have had 11 police officers hit by gunfire. Sadly, four of them have died of their these wounds. These children, these mothers, uh, these innocent people are literally at the hands of the sea and at the hands uh, of death. Today in Ascension Parish, a frantic scramble. Residents rushing to get out with whatever they could. Right now. That incredibly fast moving and extremely dangerous wildfire burning in the high desert and the San Bernardino National Forest tonight. 80,000 people ordered out of their homes. <laughs> There's a sense that um, of a, a spiritual shell shock, I feel, uh, sometimes when I look at the news, uh, and there's not, I don't know what words to use sometimes to pray, I don't know what to pray for, how to pray, and so there are times when um, in, in, in praying that I feel like I need to borrow other, people, other people's words, um, and by using their words of prayer, uh, that I learn to pray in a particular way. So for our prayers to the world, I'm going to use someone else's prayer. Um, so please pray with me. There are times, God, when it appears that our society is going to hell in a handbasket. The hellish scenarios are easy to spot in the news. And we, even in our comfortable privilege, we know various signs and degrees of hell in our own lives, too. But we confess that you are the God who was crucified, who suffered, who descended into hell, but then was raised in power to new life. So raise us this day from all of our darkness and negativities. So raise our city and our nation this day from its cruel failures and raise our world this day from its several hells and teach us how to weep and teach us how to hope while we weep and teach us how to care while we hope. Raise us, God, to new praise and glad obedience in following Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace. Amen. I would like to read the verse of the year in its context. Uh, the verse of the year we met last week uh, with Dr. Morris. And then I would like to read uh, just a little bit more of it. Um, Isaiah 6. There it is. There we go. Um, uh, in the year that King... Uh, Isaiah 6 starts with a kind of a commission for Isaiah. And it says, in the year that King Uzziah died. Um, let's pause there just a second. Um, King Uzziah had ruled since he was 16 years old, and he had been a very long-lived uh, ruler. Um, it was a time of stability for Israel. Uh, it was a time of uh, uh, relative peace. Um, and now the king is dead, and things are uncertain. Um, you can almost tie this, you get this sense 
you know, to an Israelite would recognize this right away as a time of uncertainty and fear. Uh, you can almost think we stand, I mean, if you look at that video that uh, Mr. Vanderwerf showed a minute ago, uh, we live in a time of uncertainty and f fear. Um, uh, we long for some stability. Uh, we live in similar times, maybe. So in the year that King Uzziah died, uh, I saw the Lord seated on a throne. Prophets often have these visions. High and exalted, and the train of his robe filled the temple. Of his robe filled the temple. Above him were seraphs, or angel-like creatures. Um, uh, each one of them was six wings. Two wings they covered their faces, and with two they covered their feet, and uh, with two they were flying. And they were calling to one another, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is filled with his glory. At the sound of their voices, the doorposts and the thresholds shook, and the temple was filled with smoke. So this is a terrible fearful scene. Woe is me, I cried. I am ruined, for I am a man of unclean lips, and I live among people with unclean lips, and my eyes have seen the King, the Lord God Almighty. Then one of the seraphs flew to me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with tongs from the altar, which he touched to my mouth, and he said, See, you ha this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away, and your sin is atoned for. Then I heard the voice of the Lord saying, uh, and this is our verse for the year, um, uh, who shall I send and uh, who will go for us? And I said, here I am, send me. Um, I, I've got two film clips I want to show you uh, uh, to, uh, to, to get us to think about this passage. Um, uh, one of my colleagues last year, I think I said this before, pointed out that when Nancy Knoll shows a film clip, uh, and it stops, the whole audience goes, oh, we wanted to see more, it was so loving. And then, then he said, Forrest, when you show a film clip, everybody goes, why, why, why did we just watch that? I don't get it. And um, so I, I, my first film clip I picked to be more of a crowd pleaser. Um, it's also uncertain times. Uh, it's a scene from Lord of the Rings. And if you don't know Lord of the Rings, there's bad guys that are called orcs and, uh, and Urukai, and, and they're, you know, kind of monsters, and they're attacking some humans. And the humans have retreated to a place called Helm's Deep, and all seems lost. Uh, kind of that feeling you get from watching the video of, of the events from this summer. Uh, it's kind of that feeling you get when you see that little boy who's shell-shocked. You get a sense of what Mr. Vanderwer said, of being shell-shocked. And then look at the response, and then we'll think of that. The fortress is taken. It is over. You said this fortress would never fall while you men defend it. They still defend it. They have died defending it. No other way for the women and children to get out of the caves. Is there no other way? There is one passage. It leads into the mountains. But they will not get far. The Urukai are too many. Send word for the women and children to make for the mountain path and barricade the entrance. So much death. What can men do against such reckless hate? Right out with me. Right out and meet them. For death and glory. For Rohan. For your people. The sun is rising. Look to my coming at first light on the fifth day. At dawn, look to the east. Yes. Yes. The horn of Helm Hammerhand shall sound in the deep one last time. Yes! This 
be the hour when we draw swords together. Fell deeds awake. Now for wrath. Now for ruin. And the red dawn. Stands alone. Not alone. Go hit up! There's two things I really like about this video. Uh, one thing I don't like. Uh, first, the two things. One is uh, the king, the older of the two guys uh, that are kind of the main players in, 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 the, in the bastion of Helm's Deep, uh, the king is frozen. Uh, he says this great line. Uh, in fact, that's how I found this video on YouTube. All you have to do is say, what can men do against such wanton hate? Uh, what can we do against such just this, this hate let loose. What, what can we do to fight it? Uh, and I do think this frozenness is often where we stand. Um, what can I do about the refugees from Syria? Uh, what can I do the, uh, against the hate that, that has driven them from Syria? Um, what can I do about racism in the streets of the United States and the anger that seems to be out there? It just seems to be too much and we get frozen and then that frozenness, I think, leads to a couple of things. Either we ignore it and, and just try to insulate it from our lives and pretend it's not there, which I, I'm really good at. I remember when um, one of my children was very young, if she didn't want to uh, interact with other peop peop people, she would just look away, and it was very effective. Um, uh, it, it, that, and, that, and we do that. We just look away, pretend it's not there. Or we give in to despairing kind of hatred and fear and anger, and we end up blaming other people. Uh, we end up blaming anybody else. Um, um, and um, uh, I think that frozenness is a common human response. And then I like that uh, in the midst of that frozen, Aragon, the younger of the two kind of kings or leaders in that area, says, uh, ride out with me. There's almost an echo of Isaiah's, send me, I'll, I'll go do something about this. Maybe the proper response to all of this hatred and wanton um, um, behavior, um, all of this, is, is to do something about this. Send me. Um, but then 
in that is also the one part I don't like about uh, this film clip, or at least the one thing I want to temper with it, is we often think that the only thing we can do or the only thing that will work is something heroic. I'm going to confess something to you. I, I, I have sinned. Uh, I did a sin a few years ago. I did a sin this morning. But, uh, uh, but there is one sin that I remember from a couple of years ago. A few years ago, um, uh, our superintendent came and talked to us on the first day. And things looked so financially dire for this school district. I just walked out of the meeting just like, oh, we are toast. I'm going to have to look for a new job. I don't know what to do. And then I thought, there's one thing I can do. And I went to a party store over here uh, in, um, uh, uh, off 28th Street, and I bought a Mega Millions lottery ticket. I had no idea on even how to check whether I won or not. But I thought, the only thing I can do is to become the hero and win, win the Mega Millions and come into the school and say, I have done this. Here's several million dollars. Um, but, and then here, and it's probably a sin to buy a, a, a lotto ticket because it's a wasted dollar. And the, 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 but, it, but, um, but here's where the real sin was, is I didn't write a 10 or $20 check to the school district either. Um, I didn't do anything small. And, and I wonder if we get caught up thinking all of our actions have to be heroic. A few years ago, um, at the first day, there was another kind of action verse, and I thought um, a good theme for the year would be to, to steal from Home Depot, and they put on every one of their buckets, let's do this. And, and when I thought about that, I thought I'd say, let's do this, and then I thought that the, the students would go, yeah, and I would take the bucket, and I would throw it, and they're, ah, oh, let's do this, and it would be like heroic, and then we'd run out there, and, and I... I I didn't know what we would do. Um, but we, were, we would do something. Uh, and, and so um, I, I think there's a mistake to think that we have to be heroes. Uh, I've often wanted to debate, sometimes in chapels I've debated Nancy Knoll. She has a superhero uh, class. And uh, I wonder if superhero movies get us thinking in this line. You know, what we need is a Superman. Well, Superman isn't going to change people's hearts. Uh, he'll throw big things around and, and do wonderful things, but um, um, who's the guy who has the power? Um, Iron Man, you know, he can beat people up, but uh, what, what are we, you know, what, what do we do? And so I started thinking what we have to do is uh, to think of more humble actions, or um, maybe we have to think of, of um, we got to think of changing the world, but we also have to think that we're like, we're like bricklayers, and, and we're, we're, we're just placing a humble, small brick, brick one after another. And then we have to have an, a vision of the great building that we want to build. Um, when I was in seminary, um, the guy who later became president of seminary uh, uh, was teaching a class called Doctrine of God. And in that class, um, his name was Neil Plantinga, a pretty smart guy. Um, pretty good professor. Everybody went to class. I mean, you didn't skip Neil Plantinga's class. And, um, uh, you went there, and everything he said, you kind of listened to and wrote down in margins. And uh, towards the end of the class, he kept saying how important the word hospitality is in the New Testament, and that we, we, we become hospitable. And Paul's always telling us in his letters, show hospitality to one another. And I remember when he said that, I just thought, Neil, or, uh, Dr. Plantinga, uh, I thought, Dr. Plantinga, um, that's stupid. I mean, this is a doctrine of God class. We have great doctrines that we should be thinking about. And, and if we're going to deal with the world at all, let's figure out, like, you know, what's gone wrong and let's have a grand vision because we're in seminary and doggone it, we are so smart. Um, and I've thought that for a long time. I thought hospitality was kind of stupid. Um, and I think I am completely wrong about that. Um, uh, let's think of what can I do if you send me what can I do we can start in a thousand small ways by showing hospitality uh, look at research on micro actions greet someone with a smile the micro action of a smile 
can have tremendous effect on people's days. They study it. They study it. Um, you want to work at racism? As far as I know, the only research uh, on what really changes people's hearts is an experience of somebody from a different race on your side. They can measure prejudice in people's brains. And the only thing that seems to really fight it, and, and even if you read a story of someone from a different race uh, who kind of takes the side of somebody else in a story, people's prejudice will drop m measurably. Some great blame others, anger, that tends to just make people angrier and more afraid. But smile at people. Um, stand on their side. Um, back them up. Have the courage to, um, to step out and to show small acts of kindness. Uh, greet people. Uh, learn people's names in the lockers by you. Um, you can build these small bricks that become a great and wonderful structure. The more, the older I get, the more I think love is a self-discipline. Um, and love takes courage. I remember a, a minister on a church on the north side of town, some kids had broken into the, to the church one night and, um, and, and like they like jumped on the organ pipes. I don't know what they did actually, but they, they, they vandalized it. And uh, the police or the newspaper interviewed the minister the next day. And the minister said, you know, maybe this church should have more things for kids to do and maybe we should put up some basketball hoops and maybe uh, uh, run better camps because these kids are these kids are bored and they need us what a small step of disciplined love what a great picture the second video clip i want to show you is from a movie called lars and the real girl which makes my top 10 list so it's weird it's really weird and i'm not going to try to explain it to you I remember the first students that I, I recommended it to went home and just, uh, it was Hannah Warner's sister. She came home and just said, I, I can't believe you like that film. And she mocked me for the rest of the year. Um, but it's a really good film. And what I, one of the things I like about it most is, uh, is, is that the heroes here are simple old ladies who stand with someone and they do little things and they're putting little bricks into a great and wonderful cathedral. Um, um, in this movie, um, this guy's, uh, let's just say his wife is dying. That's all you need to know. And he's kind of soul searching. It's a, a Ryan or Brian Rosling. It's a, a famous actor that you know. Uh, what's his name, Brian? Ryan? Uh, it's a Gosling guy, and um, he's, uh, he, he, he's a truly good actor. Um, here you see him doing some real acting. We'll uh, watch the clip and then talk one more thing and then we'll be done. We sent Gus and Karen to the movies. They didn't want to leave you two. I'm glad that they... I'm glad they left. I'm 
terrible that all this is happening so close to the baby coming. And that's how life is, Lars. Everything at once. We brought casseroles. Thank you. Um, is there something that I should be doing right now? No, dear. You eat. We came over to sit. That's what people do when tragedy strikes. They come over and sit. Okay. Don't you feel a little better? The, uh, um, the women in that scene, um, they are a picture of, of being Jesus to someone else. Um, uh, send me. Um, whom shall I send? Send, send me. Um, there are a thousand ways for you to show hospitality and love and the love of Christ to people. Um, and it can be small ways. People set flowers. Um, uh, old ladies come over and sit at your house in a time of tragedy and knit. Uh, and, um, uh, and a little bit of God's healing goes on. Um, so I'm asking you this year to look for ways. Uh, I'm not going to list the ways because I think you can think of ways to do this. But list, look for ways uh, to, to be sent, to go to others. Um, let's, let's do this.